every story has weak scenes, except Arcane. Arcane has weak scene, singular. That's how I feel anyway. This Kim Baron scene is really the only one I can think of that I'm like, uh, could be stronger. And we're gonna talk about the arc as a whole, even though the last scene of the arc is wonderful and doesn't need to be fixed. But there's some problems with the arc itself overall as a subplot. So let's talk about the bad, the good, and then some possible fixes. So, the bad. Listen to this. The Kim Baron scheduled an assembly. I've had enough headaches. So if you make a character excited for an upcoming scene, or worried about an upcoming scene, or angry or any strong emotion, those emotions catch with the audience. They invest us in the scene, and we also feel excited or worried or angry. And those emotions make us want to see what happens next. But if a character sees an upcoming event as a nuisance, that emotion will also catch and we'll also see it as a nuisance. That particular emotion doesn't create a desire for us to see the next scene. We read this as the character communicating to us that this thing is unimportant, it's not worth my attention. And mirroring the character, we also just want to skip what's happening next. Because there's more important things to do. And in Arcane, at this point in the story, there are a lot of important things to do. This feels like a detour. So, not a great prelude here. Second thing, stakes. We have a very indirect stake in this whole thing. The main part of Sokolov's character that we connect to is his relationship with Jinx. We care about that. His political stuff, we kind of want that to fail, and not fail in this way. Some random guy takes out Soko. It's not very satisfying. You know, if halfway through Lord of the Rings, a dragon came along and just burnt Frodo and the ring to a crisp, not a very satisfying resolution. So we get to the scene with Soko in this political conflict, and how do we want the scene to go? Well, we're not really rooting for anyone here. Not strongly anyway, and it's not mixed feelings like some of these other complex scenes, it's no feelings. We don't have a stake. If we think about it, maybe we can figure it out, take a side, but that's the problem. You need to make me feel like this is important if you want me to think about it. And I really have no reason to think this scene is important. This guy is not a threat to Soko, and that goes into my third issue here. The characters in play here are severely underdeveloped. We don't have a stake in this because who are these people? We don't have time to learn what they want or what their plans are besides, like, business stuff. It reminds me of this problem I've always had with the Star Wars prequels. You give me an evil empire, Secret plans, Rebel Alliance, that's exciting. Trade Federation, Blockade, sounds pretty boring. Chem Barons is a concept that could be so cool if they gave us cool things about them to think about. If we saw dark, sinister plans and schemes and sick, twisted methods of leadership and cunning, shocking manipulation techniques. But these three don't talk and the fourth doesn't really add much. And this guy is pathetic. And he's supposed to be pathetic, we'll talk about that. But in absence of other factors, pathetic is not where you want to be with any character. So we're just left with a scene with a nobody threatening a character whose goals we're not even really rooting for. And that nobody but he doesn't even seem very threatening, which makes us kind of know how the scene is going to go. And that's the next issue, that this whole thing is just disconnected from the rest of the story. I could edit these scenes out and a new viewer wouldn't notice that anything was missing in the show. Does Soko have a previous or lasting relationship with any of these people besides being annoyed at them? Does Savika do any characters have any sort of connection with any of these dummies? And that's another factor that lends this feeling of this scene being a detour to the main plot. Last issue, the way Soko handles this is pretty tropey, and there are good thematic aspects about it that we'll talk about, but Soko over the course of the show goes through this in intentional development from simplistic kind of cartoony supervillain, the one-eyed shadowy guy you kind of expect to stroke a cat. He goes from that to, oh, this guy has some kind of nuanced backstory, to wow, oh my god, he's adopting powder, what? Super complex, super nuanced, super interesting. I talked about that a lot in my depth video. By Act 3, Soko is a character with a lot of depth. And this scene, he's back to a sinister cartoony villain, calmly, dramatically suffocating them while giving a long villainy monologue that you can imagine pretty much any villain saying. And we have this imagery of villain making underlings grovel and suffer and submit. Super on the nose, I've seen the scene a thousand times, show me something more interesting for this interesting villain. So those are my main issues, but there's a lot of strengths to the subplot as well. As I said before, the final scene of the subplot is really good, I really liked it, mostly because of how by this point the subplot is now relevant to other parts of the story. The stakes are higher for Soko. There's an actual chance now that he doesn't get any more scenes, because we didn't respect Finn as the threat, but we do respect Savika. And that raising of the stakes is very purposeful, very direct, very well executed. Also just the way things are going for this character overall, he used to have things under control, and now at this point, every Everything in his life is destabilized. His fatherhood relationship is a mess, and now we see his leadership relationships are also a mess. And thematically, this arc is connecting him more explicitly to other characters, Vander most specifically, but also Heimerdinger to some extent. Arcane shows us a variety of leaders being deposed in different ways and handling it very differently. And we can't forget about Savika, a lot of this is for Savika's arc too. We see a lot developing here with her relationship with the status quo. And there's a lot of other smaller things, Sukko's reactions are really interesting, Savika's too, the scene is really visually cool as well, and also the scene has the huge buildup of tension than the big release, very satisfying just from the structure and the emotions it uses. And you couldn't have this final scene without having the weaker ones that preceded it, that's very fair. Doesn't get rid of those problems, doesn't make the whole subplot more necessary, but it is justification for it, that's fine. So that's all about the mechanics of the scene itself, but on a broader thematic level, the scene is also great. It develops what we've talked about before with the symbolism of difficulty breathing and polluted air in the Undercity, lack of power, the harsh conditions of life down there. Soko embraces that and lives in it. And then throughout the whole arc, we have the lighter stuff with Finn, and Hasavika slices it and uses it to light Soko's cigar 
car. That's great. And third, divorced from the scene itself, Finn is a goofball, but his design is really cool. And it's not just cool, everything about his appearance embodies his environment and his role so well. It is a fantastic design. He's Zonite to a T, his body mods, his tattoos, his fashion, the asymmetry, and these elements in specific fit with his role in the story as well. His body modification is to his mouth, his speech faculty, which is his primary tool, his words. He's this sneaky guy who tempts people with his quiet, shadowy words and quiet, shadowy places. He's a snake, basically, and we see that imagery in his tattoos. And also, more broadly, his sense of style, his sense of fashion, that also fits his role. He's trying to convince Savika that Silco is a has-been. He's preventing the Undercity from moving forward. Silco is the past, Finn is the present. He's this young guy who's fashionable, really trendy in the Zonite way. That reinforces that he's the guy who's with it. He has his finger on the pulse, he's what's now. Silco, meanwhile, boomer in a Victorian vampire costume, not so much. So very effective design. And that's enough for a lot of people, for this whole arc. I'm sure a lot of people were invested in the subplot just because its character was so cool, so interesting. Just on a visual level. They were ready to follow where this guy was taking us just from that alone. And that's great. Not me, but that's great. So let's fix this. And we have one major constraint, one limitation here, which is the super weird balancing act that causes a ton of problems in the scene. Finn and the rest of the Ken Barons need to stay somewhat pathetic and weak in order for this arc to work, which is so awkward, but let me explain. Let's say we make Finn a muscle man. So that would up the stakes, make us more engaged in the scene because Soko's now actually in danger. And that sounds great. Let's make them all muscly and dangerous. Big stakes now. But then Finn and co would be able to overthrow Soko by force on their own. They wouldn't need to ask Savika for help. And so much of this arc is about Savika being the kingmaker again. We need them to be utterly dependent on Savika's strength, on how threatening she is. So we do need to raise the stakes, we do need to develop these characters, but in ways that don't involve them becoming too much of a threat. Awkward, but that's life. Sometimes life is awkward. So let's deal with the disconnection problem first. Whole subplot doesn't feel super necessary, the characters don't even feel like it's super necessary. So how can we effectively reconnect this subplot to the rest of the story? So one small but vital thing we could do is put little kid Finn in one scene pre-time skip. Put like 15 year old Finn in this scene. He's in the shadows watching it all go down with his lighter. Put him on the street here, maybe he has like a rusty iron form of his jaw, he's struggling a bit more. Have Marcus run into him on his way to talk with Soko. Teenage Finn skulking around near Soko's hideout. We get this implication that he craves power and wants to be close to it. And what an act one appearance would do is to draw us in, and I'm talking about a hook here. And I think hooks get a bad rap. They're seen as gimmicky and superficial, which they can be, but sometimes they're really helpful, and Arcane uses hooks for a lot of its characters. Think about Soko. There's worse things than enforcers out there. We both know that. What's that all about? For Echo, we have this little hook. Little man. Oh. For Jace, we get this whole scene where we're kind of wondering who he is. Must be an inventor. We get one for Ambessa. There's one other thing. This arrived for you. I think having little things like this, little moments that generate curiosity in simple ways, can be a great tool to strengthen any story component done in the right way, of course. So if we see Finn earlier, just get a glimpse of him, we'll wonder who he is, and something as small as that goes a long way. And in particular, it'd be interesting if they showed him struggling a bit more in Vander's Undercity, and then really thriving in Soko's. That would set him up as a full to Huck, which would be a pretty cool parallel. Okay, so then when we get the reappearance of Finn in Act 3, that also does a lot. That gives the audience something to put together on our own. And it's a fairly well-known rule from Pixar, don't give the audience 4, give them 2 plus 2 and a lot of ways to interpret this rule, my theory is that 2 plus 2 generates audience participation, and participation leads to engagement, investment. When you figure something out on your own, you've now built a relationship to that idea. It's your own little thing that you created almost. Now you're invested in it, you want to see what happens to it. So if we see him early, we get that cool moment of, oh, I remember that guy, just like we get with Huck. You put it together on your own, and you remembering is what creates the significance here. That's what builds the relationship with this character. Same basic idea with Finn. And also, we would get a real progression with this, and progression does a lot of things. Most relevant to this is discussion, it produces questions. It's hard to get a lot of info from a snapshot, but with a change, that makes us ask, how did he become this? What was his goal, and how does what he's doing now fit into that goal? And is he going to get there? Is he going to achieve what he wants? And if he wanted something before and couldn't achieve it, does he now have what it takes? The very act of asking questions engages us. Once we've asked, now we want to know the answers. And it also implicitly creates stakes. The passage of time, that implied journey, we want to know if it's going to pay off. And also, progression generates feelings, a lot more feelings than just a snapshot. Again, think about Huck. If we just meet him here for the first time, maybe it's a little bit sad, but having met him before and seen him deteriorate into this, that generates a lot more feelings. Now this is a tragic story. With a character like Finn, maybe when we meet him, he's weaker, but now he's stronger and more capable, and maybe we respect that. Or maybe he's cocky now, and we hate that he became that way. Or maybe he's cocky now, and good for him, we feel he's earned it. Or to explain this from a slightly different angle here, it's harder to relate to a snapshot. Let's say Finn was awkward, and now he's cool. That's a story. Maybe you had the same story. Maybe you were an awkward teen who had a glow-up, and now you relate to him on a personal level. All this requires a progression. So that's thing number one 
one seeding fin early creates a hook, it creates a progression, and progressions make everything better. Okay, second major fix, I need to preface this one a bit. I'm going to suggest something that's probably actually impossible to implement, but it will show what I'd ideally want for the scene. So imagine Jace and Vi take out the Shimmer Factory, and then the scene happens. And we have the Ken Barons upset that their whole operations were shut down and destroyed, and the Ken Baroness lost her son, and she's full of hate now because of that. That's the kind of connection the scene needs. Make it a reaction to the events that happened in the story. Instead of Savika talking to Sokol about Jinx, awkward pause, and then, oh, by the way, the Ken Barons want to meet about abstract business interests we're told were hurt by recent events. That setup would truly connect it organically to the rest of the story. So why can't we do that? Well, because the sequencing is almost impossible. The Shimmer Factory fight happens at the end of episode 8, and the Ken Baron subplot, as it is now, starts at the beginning of episode 7. You cannot cram all of it into episode 9, that would be a mess, especially when Soko is already doing so much that episode. And good luck trying to make the factory fight earlier. That would be a mess too. So, in absence of that solution, what can we do? So let me propose a version of the scene that addresses the disconnection problem, the stakes problem, the tropiness problem, and the annoyance problem. So here's what I think you could do. Let's make the scene take place at the last drop. Soko comes down the stairs, and the Ken Barons are just there waiting for him menacingly. Maybe some of the last drop regulars are being intimidated, threatened by them, maybe they've barred the doors, and just as we're getting the sense that Soko is really in trouble here, he just unleashes the gas on all of them, and he doesn't even care that it's his own people too. And then he has Savika and some of his own henchmen who have masks literally throw them out the doors, which now ventilate the room and disperse the gas. So if we do it like that, the reason I think this potential solution is so interesting is that it demonstrates how vital setting can be in lending power to a scene. Switching the setting to Soko's home environment changes the nature of what's going on here. Now this isn't an errand Soko has to grab his keys and wallet and sit in traffic and wait in an elevator to do. No, now the scene is engaging him. If these guys are actually in the way, then it's not just an annoying thing we can skip. No. Events cannot move forward unless Soko deals with this. And now we're interested. And if you think about what I'm describing here, this is really an upping of stakes. The scene is starting out with a status quo already damaged. Soko is faced with an abrupt disadvantage right off the bat. It's no longer a meeting between equals. We're witnessing, in a sense, an invasion of Soko's territory. And now the goal of the scene isn't just demonstrating authority, which is kind of abstract and which we already kind of know Soko is good at. Now it's a problem that demands a solution. We need to remove these home invaders. And by the way, in this version, once he does solve the problem, it's a little bit less tropey because of all these new elements to the scene. He's not just making them choke and grovel because he's an evil supervillain, he's incapacitating them for a practical purpose, to remove them from the premises. It's a bit more nuanced, a bit more interesting. And he can even give the same speech if he wants, because now it doesn't feel like pure theater anymore. It's not planned, it's not just being dramatic for the sake of dramatic, it's getting stuff done in a classically dramatic Silco way. And now also in a broader scope, with this we get a stronger Vander parallel, because that scene also happened in the last drop. We see Silco dealing with this problem in a setting that makes us think back to how Vander dealt with it, or how he failed to deal with it. And we get to do that little compare contrast in our heads. So changing the setting also strengthens the connection to the story via similar characters and similar scenes. And granted, now we probably have too many scenes taking place in the last drop. You need to move the Savika Finn scene to somewhere else. You probably also need to move Savika Vi somewhere else. But okay, that's for another time. Let's move on. So one thing this didn't deal with is lack of development, and that is a tough one. Because we don't have more time to spend on developing these characters, and we don't want any more time to spend on them either. They're not that important. So if we're not developing them more beyond the scene, maybe we can develop them more within the scene. Introducing Father Finn. And to be clear, I think this is a pretty interesting solution, and it does solve the problems, but there's probably simpler ways of doing this. So take this with a grain of salt, but here's how it works. So make Finn the son of a Ken Baron, who seems like this feeble, maybe wheelchair-bound guy. We underestimate him, and we could really emphasize the physical toll of life in the Undercity. And the scene plays out generally the same here. Finn goes in all cocky, but we get a couple comments. Maybe in the lead-up scene, Savika mentions Finn, and Sokol's like, oh, that's so-and-so's kid, or the Ken prince thing. And we hear him say it in this kind of bitter mocking tone. And then in the scene, Soko has his moment with Finn, but then he kind of glares at the dad. And then Soko leaves and Finn crawls up to the dad, still coughing, and the dad looks down on him and sneers. And then Daddy Finn is the one who goes to Savika. So now instead of watching Savika suffer this pathetic fool who we don't like and don't respect, now we're curious about the contrast with this older, wiser counterpart, who probably understands the problem of Soko and Jinx in a more nuanced way than dumb kid Finn ever did. And then Daddy Finn and Baby Finn both go to Soko in the end. Savika kills Finn dead and then Soko tells Finn's son basically what he told the Ken Baroness about staying loyal and everything, but then he essentially puts him in charge in place of his dad. Which is interesting, because Soko didn't respect Finn here, but now he's granting him agency here. That's a power move, that's a real show of leadership. So forget the specifics if you don't like them, but here's what a solution like this would do. We now have a dynamic between some of these Ken Barons, instead of them just being voiceless faces. We have a much more multi-dimensional landscape in which this power struggle is taking place. We're not just seeing this power seesaw between Soko and Finn, 
Now we have the relationship between Finn and his dad. We have Sokol's relationship to each. We have Savika's relationship to each. Layered on top of that, we have a more complex new versus old dynamic in arc. So whoever it is, just adding in another agent into the mix, giving us just a little more of a variety of relationships and dynamics, that will fill out the scene a bit more, give us something more to chew on during these scenes. Now I'll offer the same disclaimer I had in my Marcus video. It's easy to suggest changes in a vacuum, but in practice, you move one piece and the whole puzzle has to shift around it. Even small changes can sometimes be impossible because of this. And then there's also logistical considerations. Is there time in the runtime of the episode for anything I'm proposing? Is there time in Fortisha's schedule to animate anything I'm proposing? Is there budget for designing it? Are they setting up for other things in future seasons with any of this? Like any of these characters? Or would any of these changes I'm suggesting give them more loose ends to tie up? Things that they don't really want to deal with, like Finn still being alive? So you can't just make any change you want and think it's going to work out. Not how it works. And that's why I don't blame Arcane for any of this. I think this scene was essentially fine for what it was. It had a lot done right. It was maybe missing a few things, felt a little weak compared to every other incredible scene in the show, which is every scene. And in the end, it didn't matter because no one was unsatisfied by the end of the episode because it had the best fight scene ever. So no one was even thinking about that scene by that point. So I think it worked out. And just a word on this video, I don't like making videos that are negative. It's just not my thing. But sometimes the discussion is interesting enough that I think it's worth it. And I do think these kinds of discussions when they're constructive can be really beneficial to have. And on that note, I'm curious, tell me something you didn't like about the show. I'm sure most of you are huge fans just like me, so it's all in the context of least favorite parts of a show that we love. But what things felt off or weak to you? Characters, scenes, themes? Let me know in the comments. Thanks to AG Nonsuch for the incredible art of Finn and his dad. Amazing artist, go follow her. Huge thanks to all the patron people. Shoutouts to Sonar taking advantage of my new monthly writing advice consultation tier. So big, big thanks. I might be switching back to weekly long videos just because of some of the topics I've been thinking about. But I don't know, so stay tuned, more shorts. Anyone interested in the crows, be on the lookout for that this week. That's finally coming. I consulted a bird expert, figured out what was going on. So I have a lot to say on that. So anyway, stay tuned. Thanks for watching.